Okay, well, we're coming to uh, the close of, I think, a fantastic two days. Um, I'd like to set the stage for our conversation today. This is how do we finance the investments needed for three interrelated challenges, providing modern energy to one billion people lacking access today, modernizing an aging energy infrastructure and mature economies, and investing in low carbon technologies, including energy efficiency improvements, renewable energy generation, carbon capture and storage, batteries for energy storage, the charging infrastructure for EVs, IT for the grid to enable real-time electricity markets, and really the list goes on and on and on. And I think a little bit too often our focus is so much about fin uh, financing renewable generation, but the reality is if we're gonna be able to meet this climate challenge, we're gonna to have to have dramatic improvements in efficiency as well. So, uh, of course, joining me in this conversation is Brian Moynihan, the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Bank of America. So thank you very much for joining us. You just set a heck of a challenge for 4.15 on a Friday afternoon <laughs> to figure out all that. But, uh... Okay, well, I'm going to start off with this. I don't know if you can see this. Can anybody read this? Maybe people in the front row. It, what it says, it says, make the world great again. Okay? And it's the cover of Fortune magazine. And uh, this is their annual Change the World issue. For, this is for 2018. And I just want to start off with congratulating you for being named the number three overall company in their 2018 issues about companies that changed the world. And you were cited uh, for issues like your green bond program and, and your investments or your commitments to investments in low carbon energy and so forth. Uh, you were also uh, named in the 2017 Euro Money uh, uh, thing as the uh, world's best bank for corporate social responsibility. And in particular, you were acknowledged for demonstrating that good corporate citizenship is good business. And, and I've heard you talk about the strategy about responsible growth. So I was wondering if you could tell us what, what do you mean by responsible growth? Well, we have to grow because otherwise I won't be running the company and my management team will be gone because somebody else will be doing it. And we have to do it with the right risk and you know, financial services has to stay within the risk parameters. But the most important part is we have to be sustainable and that is the best place for teammates to work and that's about how we benefits and, and development and everything we do. We have to drive operational excellence which gives us the right to spend the money to do the things that we're talking about here. And then we have to uh, share our success with the communities and so it comes out that sharing success for communities. The bank that carries the name Bank of America started in San Francisco as a product of that community. The oldest part of our company was in, from 1784. But they're all started by the communities to help make the community successful. And unless we f create financing and capabilities of all the list you made earlier, we're going to have a problem with the communities being successful. And, uh, and so you know, it comes out of that basic understanding that that's, if a community is successful, we're successful as an industry and as a company and helping make this change and, and financing it and using the creativity with your team and our team and all the teams out here, we can, uh, we can, we can slay it. It's just gonna take a lot of work. Yeah. So when I think about responsible growth, I, you know, I kind of think about sort of being in for the long haul and uh, you know, given all the pressures of short-termism and you know, how, how do you, how do you, you know, navigate that road? Well, that's the work that we do to we as a company, we, we are, we are short-term managers with long-term focus. So we're always, we have to produce the results for our customers, our clients, our capabilities, our products, but we have to be thinking across time. And so we are making investments which are three, five, 10 years out all the time and to help us become more efficient and run the company. And we're making investment in communities and, and at the same thing. So we'll do four and a half billion dollars last year in low to moderate income community development, we'll do $200, billion, $200 million of charity. So since this management team's in, we've done $2 billion of pure philanthropic giving. We've done about 20 million volunteer hours in the last nine years. So you're, you're investing long-term strategies to drive it. At the same time, you do have to balance that. And that's what you know, management teams get paid for, is we have to do both. And it's not a or, it's an and. We have to deliver decent numbers, and we have to deliver long-term value. And I think most of corporate world is starting to really understand that. And so this, the same development goal commitment we've made through the International Business Council, the 150, 200 companies have committed to that. You know, they, they see it. 
And so the, the fellow here before from BlackRock talking about with Larry and Fink and what he's done, what we've done and others, we're driving the world to say, you can do both. And we want the investors to see it, we want the companies to see it, we want the academic community to see it, and if it works, then I think it's a better place uh, for capitalism to go. Okay, thank you. So uh, in, in the depths of the, the financial crisis, I believe you committed $20 billion to investments in low carbon uh, energy systems. And, and more recently, you, you've added $125 billion in financing for low carbon and sustainable businesses. How did environment come to be so important to the bank and, and, and what kind of work have you been doing towards those ends? Well, we started about I don't know, 15, 18 years ago, there were commitments made. Um, but coming out of the crisis, you, know, you, could see, you could see the issue accelerating, and you could see that the real issue was financing. You know, you need more money. It, it wasn't, there, there was gonna be lots of technology and lots of ways to slay the dragon from that stand, the stuff that you and your colleagues work on and policies had to change, but you just needed money. And so we, we said, you know, we commit to the 125 billion. The first is how we operate, so we've taken our you know, footprint down and down and down. The second is, uh, you know, how do we get our clients and think about what we do as, in a business? And then third is, how do we finance the change from where we are today, wh where we want to be? And this is not abrupt, it's how do you change, and then how do you get creative, how you can accelerate that change? So if you think of, you've got an arc, and every year you can move it in, you improve the outcome. The financing is about how you start moving that arc around. So whether it's you know alternatives or whether it's technology that we've done to put money into technology research, whether it's uh, you know moving from the worst to the second worst, so you can move to the third worst. You know, in, in helping do that, it's all about that stuff. And so green bonds and getting people to commit. It's it's, it's a range of stuff. So we're at 125 billion, we're 70 billion dollars uh, into it. At some point, we'll exhaust that, and then we'll make another commitment and drive it. But 125 billion at the time, you know, for uh, 2014, 13, or whatever it was, that was a big number. Nobody ever committed to that kind of level of financing, and the question was, could we do it? And the answer is, we are, which yeah. is pretty. It's it's pretty neat, and that caused other people to think about the commitment. Okay, well, that's that's terrific. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so even as clean energy costs have come down, you know, you hear photovoltaics at two dollars a kilowatt hour, two cents a kilowatt hour, and wind, you know, very inexpensive. And so the technology itself has come down, but the cost of capital for renewable energy still remains high, and financing costs have, you know, are a big obstacle to getting some of these projects going. And you know, what are you doing to lower the cost of capital? for these projects, and could you give us some examples of some things that you think have been a success? Well, the, the, the key is to open up more and more vehicle, more and more capacity, and so if you think about some work we did leading up to our com commitment and ultimately after our commitment leading up to some of the work that was an initiative at the UN called Sustainable Energy for All, and then ultimately in the Paris, was trying to identify how big the gap is. And you can get estimates that we need a trillion or two trillion a year, whatever the number is. But at three or four hundred billion or whatever's going in now, you have a big gap. And so the question is, you can't fill that gap. So the United States government budgets, you know, three trillion a year. How much can they dedicate to fill the gap? You know, there's only, a, and they do a lot with that budget, Medicare, Medicaid. So the question is, how do you get more money at it? And so what we've been trying to figure out a lot is yes, we put 125 billion in, but we need to access the balance sheet of our company, the balance sheet of you know, BlackRock and other investors, uh, that are the assets they manage, um, and that takes policy changes, it takes structural ch structure changes, it takes some creativity and some innovation. You know, securitize. We were just talking with uh, Joaquin Levy and others about you know, Tom about securitizing the the spread between the cheaper alternatives today and the longer term, and praying that forward and using that to invest faster. It's gonna take all those types of things, and that's a strategic finance initiative here, is really to try to bring together people who can figure out that. Ultimately, it's gonna take policy changes, de-risking, whether it's political risk or duration risk, which is really political risk, and it's gonna take um, ways to bring that money. It's there and it wants to come, but it can't come in size unless it has a, a way to calculate the return it's gonna get. So somebody may say, I take 100 basis points a year less on this, Insurance company could say I take 100 basis points because this is good stuff. 
but if they think they could lose their principal, they're never going to do it. And that's going to come down in a project to the duration of the project, which has come down to political risk. And so that's what you need to do there. Someplace in the United States, that's not the issue. It's really just kind of get the money fast up. That's green bonds and getting people to commit to use those proceeds to change their behavior, which then creates behavior in the market. And so I think you know it's it's tax, it's policy, it's de risk, it's innovation, and it's and then it's just talking to people and saying you know you can do this and and it does it's not gonna it's good business. So we do the 125 billion. I don't want to apologize for it. It is good business. That means I can do it over and over again. If it was charity, I could only do it once maybe, and it would take me a long time to do it. But if I can do it as good business, it's good. So a question on the $125 billion. Did, did you see others following quickly in your footsteps? Did that sort of catalyze a transition in, in, in the rest of the finance industry? Well, the finance industry, you're seeing people do it. But I, I think what's been interesting about something like green bonds, so we were the largest underwriter of green bonds. But that's not the important thing. Since we started doing it uh, eight, nine, 10 years ago, whatever it was, 12 years ago, we did about $27 billion. In the year 2017, we did six as an underwriter. So what does a green bond mean when you underwrite it? We, you, company issues the bonds, they go to it. They take whatever proceeds they get, a billion dollars, a half billion dollars, a quarter billion dollars, a hundred million, and they then have to use it consistent with the principles of that, which means they're improving their outcome, which may mean <clears throat> they'll um, go get clean energy to supply their data centers. It may mean that they actually uh, reclad buildings. It may mean a lot of things, but it means they have to take that money and do it. So. Our activation really enables them to activate. That's not on our balance sheet at all. You know, it's, 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 it's the bonds are going to the investors. So the investors are saying, I'm doing good, good work by investing in green bonds. But the real catalyst of change is the companies that issue them have to change. And so you've gone from whatever the math would be for 26 billion over 12 years to 6 billion in a single year. You're seeing us accelerate. And if we can keep more companies saying that's how they express, an operating company express its interest and, it might, and what it does internally. As financing companies have come and other of my peers have come, so there's other green bond underwriters. We don't own the market. We're a substantial part of it. So they've come and helped facilitate even more companies. And so while well, we helped drive a truck through the structure, a few of us, now it's pretty well done. And so you're seeing okay. the markets you know, increase in size dramatically. That $26 billion is just what we've done, and there's multiples of that in the market. Yeah, oh, yeah that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to switch to a slightly controversial topic, You know, this audience where uh, the all of the above, we you know are heavily engaged in, in long-term relationships with traditional energy industry as well as renewable energies and so forth, and you know there are a number of, of, of activists uh, who aggressively advocate for the elimination of all fossil fuels for energy generation, and uh, Bank of America, you know you clearly have many existing rela relationships with traditional energy companies as customers and you know how do you reconcile you know one foot in both of these camps it's uh, you know there's people that say why don't you quit financing all these things so we quit and it will go on so the question is how we can get people to actually change what they're doing and and so by having the leadership we took on coal for example we started people thinking about the question we just didn't agree with what the, the, the activists at the time were saying. We sat there and said, how do we help these companies that are in the business make the transition? So w when we talk to energy companies, and we're in energy still, you're saying, show us the way you're going to make progress. And you know, the disclosure is one thing, but also the strategy is the more important thing. And if they're willing to do it, then I think they should be supported, because that then gets the energy behind making the change happen. If you say we're just going to cut everybody off, That'll feel good for an hour, and then you'll sit there and say, wait a second, this isn't going to work, and we're not going to have the power to have these spotlights on us or something like that. So we need to figure out how to make the transition happen. In our mind, you have to have a rational approach. How we look at it is if people are willing to join the fight to make the change happen, we will support them. If they're not moving fast enough, hate the investors they have and potentially the lenders they have have to put more pressure on them. But it's a, it's a, it's a conscious decision not to be you know, absolute, but to be you know, if we believe it's a change which is going to occur over time, how do we accelerate, how we drive it, how you do it. If you just say, I'm getting out, that may feel good for the moment, but it doesn't have any impact on the company. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk to the companies, we say, there is a way that, as an investor, we have $3 trillion of assets in our wealth manager platform, et cetera. And, and you say, people can get out of your stock. It used to be harder, but technology allows them to do it. So you need to be showing people how you're going to help make the transition. Is our advice to them. They can take it or not. And so it's not only what we do as financing, it's how we describe to them the investors that we shepherd money for, just $3 trillion, how they're going to approach it ultimately. 
And so you're saying to them, we can construct vehicles of which you're excluded. So if you don't give us anything to defend you, it's not going to happen. So we make the decision on our ESG committee and everything. But the reality is you make a decision by people who are actually trying to solve the question as opposed to ignoring it. If they're trying to solve it, you got to help them. And then if they don't help them fast enough, then you'll push them. And that, that's kind of how it plays out. And it won't satisfy everybody, but that's, you know, when you have a company that's one in two Americans that you do business with, believe me, we get one in two opinions in that, if you think about it. Everybody, you know, it's, it's nature of the beast. Yeah. Well, and I, I think also the reality is, is that um, you know, energy is hugely important to our economy. And if prices spike, if they go up really high and down really, it's so disruptive. So that you know, maintaining stability uh, with a more orderly transition, it certainly is helpful, I think. Well, and, and you know, you think about the great minds of a place like Stanford, and you think about you know, Secretary Schultz and others, you know, thinking about this, and having, but having a rational basis to say, it ain't going to happen overnight. We need the energy. We got to make it better, cheaper, uh, less fossil fuel, and we got to be relentless about it. And we can't be complacent about the duration of it. You know, that that's actually good to get the energy focus there, as opposed to the absolutes in the near term, because it's just not going to happen. Um, and that, it, you know, it, it. You know, I live in Boston, and you look out, and the waves get higher over the, you know, Fano Hall and that stuff every day. And, and you're saying, but at the same time. You know, the power grid's powered by these big LNG tankers coming up, and so, and they're tankers, you know, and you're sort of saying, we got to figure out something that's better than this alternative, which is, you see the impact on the harbor, and you see these big boats coming up, but we have to realize, you look around, there's this wonderful city that needs power, too, so yeah. it, figuring that all out, I think, is what the talent and organizations like this can help drive in, in, in environments like this, and get an understanding that we got to make the progress. So... There have been a number of studies which suggest that we need to triple the amount of investment in clean energy technologies to you know, meet Paris goals and beyond. Uh, are, are you optimistic that the, that the world has these resources and, and that we're on a pathway to get to that point? Or, or do we need some significant sort of reset to, to reprioritize uh, being able to achieve that? I'd say there's two questions. The world has the resources. So if you think about the balance sheets of the banks and the trillions of dollars that represents the balance sheets of insurance companies, the operating expense that can be used to change energy consumption in an operating company, there's tremendous resources out there. What you can't rely on, not because they don't want to help, is the governments are, you know, governments are zero sum or deficit games. And so therefore, they don't have a lot of extra money sitting around to help. So we have to figure out how the private sector has brought the task. Where the government can help us is, you know, taking away risks and and, at, and get, you know making concessions last to allow the transaction to take place. They can help on structures. They can help on incentives, um, but they, it's hard for them to bring the money because all, all the money comes in every year goes out, and, and frankly, more does, right? And so they're not going to be there. But the way I frame it to get people sort of figuring it out. Um, when we did the work with sustainable development, uh, C for all, and that was sort of. At the time, I think we said there was two 250 coming in a year, and we needed a 750. By the time I got to Paris, I, you guys had the numbers to 400 and, and three tri two trillion or something like that. The numbers have kept expanding, but the principle is the same. We've got to bring the balance sheets to it, and I, I think I think that's why the strategic finance initiative and things like that are important. We've got to figure out how, within the construct of the energy policy, how you bring these initiatives to the table. And you heard. Uh, you know, Yakim and, and, and Tom and others talk about it in one of the earlier panels. There's a lot of creative energy going on. We got to be careful. It's pragmatic and thoughtful. It can't be really just thoughtful and theoretical. It has to be very pragmatic, which the real risk is how to use development banks to truncate political risk. How do you get that balance sheet of the insurance company to come? Uh, because then they, they, they won't be criticized for having that. How you have the RWA calculation, which is tedious bank language, but the, the asset cost come down and they can, you know, so Mark Carney and FSB thinking about how you reduce that in Basel. Can you give us a little credit, which provides an incentive and mm -hmm. adds some leverage. So it's, the money is there, I'm convinced. The enthusiasm around the money is there, but it's going to take some accommodations to get it to start to flow in volumes, and that's going to become more from the regulatory, governmental, and frankly, the innovation. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, well, which sort of sets up the, the question that you've kind of highlighted this, that uh, you know, the biggest barriers to these projects from a finance point of view is risk. That can be political risk, it can be market risk, currency risk, credit risk, operational, all these different risks. And, 
And there are a number of different entities that have a role to play. You know, there's the role of the bank, there's the role of government and regulators, and there's the role of the development banks. And, and I just want to set the stage a little bit for you that I would say that two thirds of this audience uh, probably knows very little about finance. And, and we've heard. It's not the two thirds up here, hopefully. <laughs> and we've heard illusion. <laughs> yeah. So picture that you're you know, at a university and maybe a little bit of teaching. Uh, we've heard about blended finance. Right. And, and I'm not sure that everybody kind of really gets it. Could, so could you try to make that a little bit real, like for a real project, what might that look like? And, and what, what do you want from your partners and so, so forth? So let's compare two possible ideas, maybe, as a way of thinking. Uh, let's say that you're going to do something in, a, in the, uh, the state of California. And let's say you're going to do something in uh, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you have political upheaval and ballot amendments and everything going on in the state of California. But it's a democracy. It's lasted for a long time. And it's invented in a country that's lasted for 250 years. So you don't have to worry about this question that when the commitment's made by the state of California, it will be, it will be there. So if the state of California says either we're going to guarantee the tariff, we're going to give you the land, we're going to let you rent it for a dollar, we're going to, uh, whatever it is, you know that's going to happen. Um, that's not, I shouldn't use any particular country because that, to say I'm, I've got an opinion, but that doesn't happen in some of these developing countries. There's, you know, even take Italy. Italy's had 40, a government every year, I think, since the Second World War or something like that. So you don't know, how can you do a 30-year financing in that constant? So it's hard, so an insurance company's got to go in and say, I'm going to do a 30-year you know, five hundred million dollar permanent financing for a facility, and it can be an alternative facility. It could be a more effective facility. It could be anything you want, or a, uh, a better water facility, whatever it would be. Um, I'm going to do a thirty year financing. The issue is, if the government changes, they'll take it from me. And I always hear people say, "No," but we've been there. We had our bank taken from us in a lot of countries and given back and taken. And so that political risk is really a duration of the investment. If you're only investing for two years, you take it. So California will get the money. It may or may not need it. And that other country won't get the money. And let's say, let's make it simple. Let's say it was two solar power plants. So they're going to get the money because when they agree to the concession, they agree that government's binding a government for the time. When you go over to this country, that government can be gone and they'll, they'll walk away from it so nobody will take the risk or else the cost goes through the roof. What we hope we can do with people who can go across, so. Joaquin and Dr. Kim and people like that can go in because they never get, don't get paid and, or in central banks and our development banks. They can go in and say, we'll take away that duration risk. We'll guarantee you that you won't lose the concession. Therefore, you're guaranteed whatever it was, you know, the, the operating level revenues or, and we'll guarantee you get that and we'll, and we'll make that government, we'll stay, you know, the next government live up to the things. And for that, that'll bring a lot more money and a lot cheaper money because you can't price that risk. People then get into currency hedges and stuff. That you can actually, 30 year currency hedges are tough, but you can, you can probably get people to work around that, but they can't work around government change. And these countries have significant government change. This is not a developed country. Uh, it's more of a developing country. And it'd be arrogant for the developed countries to say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll bring all the money to help us make this change, but you can't have, you can't use the, the fossil fuel dependent sources of energy because we think that's bad for the world, but, but we're not going to give you any ability to do anything else. That's, that's arrogant or mean-spirited by the rest of the world. So we have to help them develop power. Mm -hmm. And so, so we're looking for people to take that. I don't know if that's, yeah, if that's yeah, no, that, that enough. Helps. So, so when I hear you, though, I, I picture. So blended finance is to get the government to put their guarantee on it, uh -huh. then get, or get them to take the first 10 years risk, or get them to do something that you bring the money longer, to, or they'll take the last 20 years risk, or in the first 10 is taken by the private sector. The first loss risk, there's a lot of ways to do it, but you're bringing multiple parties to do it, and then that's financeable. That's good. No, I, I understand that. So it sounds to me, though, when I listen to you, that I kind of picture that there will be a lot of sort of one-off deals that might be very specific to a particular locality, and you know that takes all the transaction costs would probably be really huge, a lot of discussions. So can we get to a point where this blended finance is sort of replicable, you know, like cookie cutter, everybody knows how to do it, you have the right. standard set of financial tools that it's like, okay, this is our approach. If you, it would be much more efficient to do that, to create a pool that sits above those projects, the type of project we're talking about, uh, that would 
be able to do it and also blend the risk out from multiple projects is another way to do it. So you'd have a bunch of countries and what's the probability all those countries walking away is lower and then it could slap a guarantee or some sort of insurance or some sort of partial protection on top of it. So that would be more efficient. And so if you created, you know, if you took the, the commitment if Paris ever got funded, you took that as the equity in that and then you leverage it, you know, multiples of that and the people come with that and then you had the government that are represented in Paris, which is all the governments in the world except for one, um, you would then get the ability to, to have them all agree that they won't walk away, mm -hmm. and that probably could then uh, uh, scale it. So the second concept is not do it project by project, but do it a pool of money that could replenish and refresh, and, and the money off the first 10 projects start to fund the next 10 and stuff. You know, I think those are all possible. I, I think they're complex because now you're talking about global multi-jurisdictional um, um, risk and, and, and you know, that, that can take some execution, but it does lower the risk to blend across, you know, multiple, the, the probability of 10 countries in a row having the same problem is lower than one. Okay, all right. So, so you've been a really generous supporter of Stanford University. You, you supported the Global Climate and Energy Project, and now you've started uh, the Sustainable Finance Initiative, and of course, we're really excited about that. Um, if you had to have one wish of what we could accomplish together, uh, what would that be? The, the power of a university, this university, and of this stature is a convening power to bring everybody together to bring the creative, creativity, innovation, and get the people to think of solutions and then use the analytical capabilities to test them. Not theoretical solutions, pragmatic solutions. And I think around finance, we're at the stage where we need those, we need people to agree, whether it's you know, the development banks, whether it's private industry, whether it's academia, whether it's the uh, uh, public sector, uh, uh, government, you know, uh, type of people. We need them all in a room to, to really come up with structures and solutions. And then we need to publicize the role that various counterparties can play in them. Because what was interesting, we did it, when we announced the, a $10 billion catalog fund at the uh, UN four or five years ago, four years ago, I guess it was, and you know, I spoke and said, we're gonna do this $10 billion fund, and people called me and said, I'll put the money in. And it was like, you know, just, they were just looking for vehicle capabilities. So I think the, the other thing that you hope with the, the, you know, the pulpit that this place has uh, in the initiative will have, that they can explain to people cogently what they can do and to participate. And I think that's the, uh, that's the extra element. Is so not just to have a think tank where people are thinking of answers, but also then to say, we've got some answers at work, we've got best practice, we've got understanding, we got what has to happen. And then we can go to the insurance companies of the world and say, you know, here's what you need to how to think about this. And we can go to the governments that are regulating those insurance companies, say, if you did this, they could come. And you know, and if you went to the development banks and said, and I think that's the power of it. It's a convening power and an explanatory power and hopefully the solution providing, but solutions to have everybody in the room. Great. Well, thank you. Hopefully, we'll be a think and do tank. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, join me in thanking um, Brian Moynihan. Yeah.